country, we don't swear an oath to an individual or a political party. We take our oath to defend the United States Constitution. And that oath must mean something. Tonight, I say this to my Republican colleagues who are defending the indefensible. There will come a day when Donald Trump is gone, but your dishonor will remain. As Americans, we all have a duty to ensure that what happened on January 6th never happens again, to set aside partisan battles, to stand together to perpetuate and preserve our great republic. That was former Congresswoman and Vice Chair of the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol, Liz Cheney, with a warning to her own party. Since those hearings, we've seen the Republican Party elect a House Speaker who Cheney says cannot be counted on to uphold their oath to the Constitution. Well, and, and, and one who actually took the lead in the big lie. And back another Trump term, even as the former president openly touts an extreme and authoritarian agenda while facing 91 criminal counts. And Liz Cheney joins us now. She is a professor of practice at the University of Virginia's Center for Politics and author of the new book out today entitled Oath and Honor, a memoir and a warning. And thank you very much for coming on the show this morning um, to talk Thanks about your book. Thanks for having me, Mika. We all watched and were impressed and aghast at your work during the January 6th committee hearings. Um, you know, just just to name a few things, we've been talking this week about the latest issue of The Atlantic, which is a deep dive into a look at the dangers of a second Trump presidency. And we look at Trump's own words. Even now, we could go on for four hours and still have a not, not enough time to talk about the things he says he will do, the things he has said he would do and has done. So my first question to you, with so much insight into this, into the Republican Party and what is happening to it, um, why do you think he is still very much the front runner for the Republican nomination? And... How much do the reasons you have for that concern you about the future? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me on. And, and thank, thanks to you guys and to, to everybody here for the coverage that you've been giving of this issue now for so many years. It really is important and, and very much appreciated. And you've put your finger on um, what I think is, uh, you know, one of and maybe the most important question politically, certainly, that we face at this moment. And I think there are, there are a combination of things going on. Um, I think, first of all, there are millions of people around the country who feel like they, they are not heard by the government, who have felt like they don't have a voice. And uh, Donald Trump has managed to convince them uh, dishonestly that, that he could be their voice. And so I think that reflects a certain percentage of the Republican Party. It's, it's not a huge percentage. Uh, certainly the people in Congress who actually believe what he's saying is very, very small. But, but he's enabled and, and uh, appeased um, and collaborated with by people who know better in, in leadership in the Republican Party today. And, and that's partly what makes him so, so dangerous, right. uh, is people have been willing to look the other way and, and go along even when they know, know that's wrong. You know, it once was they would look the other way because, you know, they, won't, they don't want to lose the base. They don't want to lose their, their seats in Congress. But you write that, you know, even during the Trump impeachment time, that some members, maybe even many, were scared for their own safety if they would vote toward impeachment. Can you tell us more about that, what you heard? Yeah, I mean, it was... It was um widespread in many instances. Uh, people would say it directly. Uh, a knowledge that if they did the right thing, if they publicly opposed Trump, if they voted for his impeachment, for example, that they would be putting themselves and potentially their family at risk. Um, you know, I, I talk in the book about the vote the first time that, that the Republicans attempted to oust me from my conference chair position, um, where, you know, we prevailed significantly. Uh, it was a secret ballot. And I suspect that had impeachment been a secret ballot, for example, um, the numbers would have been, been you know, much more, uh, many more Republicans would have voted in favor of impeachment. Now, that's, you know, the fact that we're living in a situation where 
you have to think about a secret ballot because people want to protect themselves because people feel they're threatened mm. by violence. That's it's not a place that we've been before in this country. Congresswoman, uh, what's very clear reading this book is that you knew this effort was going to cost you your job, that you knew a state in Wyoming where Donald Trump won by 43 points. It was not going to be popular, <clears throat> excuse me, to stand up to him. So as you undertook this fight, did you give any consideration to your political career, to your political future? You have a lot of road ahead of you still, senator, maybe higher office as well. How did you balance those things? Because clearly you and Adam Kinzinger and a small handful of others made that choice when most of the others said, no, this job and this power is more important to me. Um, you know, in a, in a way, it's a it's a difficult question to answer because I never thought about it that way. And, and I was surprised that people did think about it that way. Um, and that's the only me, reason I asked, because so many other people did think right, about it that way. Right. And, and to me, there was no question about what the Constitution required. And so, you know, beginning actually while we were being evacuated from the floor of the House, while we were being rushed down the steps, you know, into the tunnels underneath the Capitol, um, I knew then that that he had to be impeached and removed. He was a clear and present danger. It was, you know, obvious that he was not uh, sending help. He was not telling the mob to stop. Uh, and, and, you know, each moment that went by, it was just obvious, uh, self-evident that that was uh, in another, you know, moment of an impeachable offense. So I think that, that the, um, the founders were very clear about trying to ensure that uh, people who are elected and in elective office um, swear an oath to the Constitution and put something above, you know, what they called factionalism, uh, allegiance to a single individual. And I think what we've seen over the last couple of years is how important that really is, how much that really matters, and, and what we have to demand of our elected officials. And you publish here in the book the remarks you never got to make on January 6th, where you made the case you're making right here, which is this is not a close call. Right. We in Congress do not have the power to overturn the will of the voters, but so many of your colleagues did, in fact, do that. And we mentioned Mike Johnson, the current Speaker of the House. He's a constitutional lawyer by trade and by practice and by education. And yet he led that charge. And you say in the book, he sent out a, a caucus wide email that said, Donald Trump has directed me to get a list effectively to take names who is signing on to our brief and who is not. And he's going to be very well, disappointed in those who mm -hmm. didn't. Can you say more about that and how you responded to it? Yeah. Um, when that email went out, um, I heard from a number of members as soon as they received the email, uh, who were very concerned, who said, wait a minute, is this is this a threat that, you know, Donald Trump is going to be looking at this list? And, um, of course, Mike said, no, 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 he didn't mean it that way. Um, but but he what he was doing very much with that amicus brief was, first of all, conveying to members that, you know, this amicus brief really um, doesn't suggest that we understand or that we believe or that we're asserting that there's been fraud. But of course, it was doing precisely that. And um, he was convincing members to sign on to something that, um, you know, through my discussions with him, through I enlisted others. You know, I went to Kevin McCarthy's uh, senior lead attorney, uh, and she also was similarly concerned and had been talking to Mike and saying, this is without basis in the Constitution. So um, it was troubling to see. And, and, and frankly, uh, it was really disturbing. He was a friend of mine. And, and I was uh, surprised and sorry to see the path he was willing to go down. There's so many vivid scenes in these that we were discussing as you sat down this moment. And I'll let you tell the story when there was a no confidence vote for you, a caucus meeting. Uh, Congressman Kelly of Pennsylvania uh, described his feeling toward you how. Well, this was um, in February, the first time that I was um, that they, they, they attempted to oust me. And uh, we had a four hour conference meeting that I presided over where people basically went to microphones and stood up. And, and there were people who were supporting me, people who were very angry with me over the impeachment vote, over the statement that I issued to impeach. And um, there were a number of the men who stood up and expressed uh, frustration and anger with my attitude frustration and anger with my tone, um, said that I was just too defiant. That was my problem. Um, but the emotion was running very high. And, um, and I think what was one of the most surprising moments of the meeting was the one you mentioned where uh, Congressman Kelly suggested that, you know, watching me vote to impeach was like 
you know, playing in the biggest game of your life and looking up and seeing your girlfriend mm. sitting in the stands of the opposing team. It was a moment where, you know, I, you're sort of standing up there presiding. <laughs> wow. and you, 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 so what do you say? Right. I, yeah. No, I mean, and, it was and, and some, wait, wait, some of your wait, colleagues wait did shout now, as well. Hold on, hold on. Right. 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 Yeah. right. right. Who, is it? who is this guy? Mike Kelly. I'm sorry. Who is Mike, Mike Kelly? And what was Mike's position in, in the caucus? Um, he was a, a member of, of the conference. He was, you know, a uh, yeah. I mean, it, what, was, what was your position in the conference? Uh, well, I was the chair of the conference. Yeah. Okay. Um, so your tone. Okay. So can you ask me? Can you answer this see, question? Your tone. Why, your demeanor. Why would the chair be sitting up in the stands? Well, one of 435 would be on the field. I don't. I don't. What in the world? I don't quite understand that that analogy. No, it, it, Can you it's, it, well, I can't really help you, Joe. I mean, it, it left me speechless. Um, Back to Billy. You know, yeah. No, it was, Sorry, it was stunning. Yes, yeah. she's, right, she's the quarterback in that analogy to answer <laughs> exactly. your question, Joe. Yeah, yeah. No, no question who, the, uh, who yeah. the star on the field was. Uh,